Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. We are back with another episode of Daily Pound Tier. On today's show, we're gonna be talking number one about price action. Number two, about the Voyager Space Partnership that they got last week that we didn't get a chance to talk about. So I'm gonna be discussing that partnership and why that partnership and space as a vector or a uh, industry that Pounder can get into is very exciting. And then finally, we're going to look at Mariana's question during the Q4 earnings call. She asked a really good question about international government growth. That was the lowest metric in terms of Pounder's growth rate. U.S. commercial was the best. Overall commercial was better than government. International commercial wasn't the best. So I want to analyze what CARP said to that question and ultimately what Pounder's plan is over the next 10 years to figure out how do they scale international commercial at a time where a lot of international companies or countries really just aren't that interested in buying Pounder yet. Don't go anywhere. Friday. Let's get into it. All right, cool. So let's start off with the price action on Pounder. Here we go right now. We got 24.76 on the day. And uh, the reason we're here at this 24.76 level is for two main things. So obviously we're down about 2.5% of the day. We had two pieces of data come out in the United States, uh, PPI producer price index that was at 2% year over year or month over month. Uh, that was higher than the 1.8, the 1.6% expected. And it was higher than last month's 1.8. So this, the, the, the street thought we would go from 1.8 to 1.6. We put up a 2% number. Wasn't the best for people. What it wasn't the best for stocks. Now in, in general, a lot of stocks recovered from some of their lows. SMCI actually took a pretty hefty hit, 17% 17 down today. Uh, but then we also got housing data right after PPI, and it showed that in the United States, we are seeing 14% less homes created month over month, which inevitably the argument is, or at least how the, the way that I think the market is going to interpret that, is that there's going to be a little bit more shelter inflation, uh, which is already 50% of the current inflation in the CPI that we have right now. So if there's going to be more shelter inflation, because if we have less houses and people want to buy, the demand is going to go up in order to supply that demand, you're going to have to raise prices if you don't actually have the supply. That's going to lead to some more effects on inflation writ large, which probably gets rid of a possibility of a May cut and most likely pushes it into July in the summer. And so as a result of that, the entire market is down. On top of that, today is Friday. The market tend will probably tend to sell off because um, it's a three-day weekend. Monday is President's Day in the United States, so we don't have the stock market open. So people are probably capturing some gains. Now, regardless of all the bad news I just talked about in terms of macroeconomic data, Palantir, $24.73, down only 2.65% of the day. To me, it's very exciting because we are finding a way to consolidate in this $24 to $25 range. If you look at the order flow right now, $219 million has left the stock today. $215 million has entered. Volume is at $43 million. So volume has definitely died off over the past couple of days. Uh, we've had volume again of $400 million, $200 million, $100 million, $150 million. The last two days, it's been $80 million, which is much lower than the volume we've had before. And it looks like today, maybe we end up at $50 or $60 million, which is just significantly lower than what we had before. So when volume dies down on a stock that is 2 billion shares outstanding, in order to get the stock price to have a little bit more momentum in it, you're going to need that volume to, to pick up. And if that volume is not there, maybe the consolidation happens in 24, 25, even if the volume is not there. Or maybe we see a little bit of a break to the downside because there's some sell side pressure, but it's not as big of a break to the downside. Because at this point, I'm thinking if Pouncher was going to go back to that $18, $19 range, like it, it kind of would have happened right now. It's been two weeks post earnings. I feel like the narrative has changed. We saw institutional ownership has gone up from about 39 to 41%. So I don't feel as comfortable saying it's getting likely that it would go back to 1819 outside of a macro event or an internal event in the company, aka they don't get the Titan contract or inflation gets really bad. Outside of that, I think consolidation is very possible. Now, if NVIDIA cracks on earnings on February 21st, that could affect the entire market. So we have to keep an eye on that. But we are consolidating at least in the past two weeks in this 23 to 25 range. We really need to maintain $23.30 from a technical perspective. If we break below that, then, then there's a, we get into an entire new channel and we could probably fall to that 22.8 range. Uh, but if we can stay above that, which we'll see, I think today we'll close you know, around this 24.60 range. And then throughout the next week, if we can stay in these levels, even if we don't move for the next six months and it's stuck at 24 to 25, we're up from 16, we're up 50% for the year. So from that perspective, uh, Pound had a really good week. It closed over 25 three times this week. And now... Over the next couple of weeks, we'll see where it goes. Next thing we got to talk about is uh, this partnership Palantir signed with Voyager Space. So first of all, this was on dailypalantir.substack.com. It is in the description. We are five subscribers away from 3,000 subscribers. It is free to subscribe. So please, please, please make sure to subscribe. You get an email newsletter every single day about everything going on in the world of Palantir. This was the press release we got, and I want to analyze this. Okay, so let, let me just read a little bit from here with Palantir and Voyager. So... 
Palantir provides adaptable software solutions and architectures to ensure the resilience, effectiveness, and availability of U.S. defense and space capabilities. The collaboration between Voyager and Palantir will center around the joint exploration of cutting-edge AI and machine learning capabilities aimed towards technology demonstration missions on the International Space Station. Pretty cool stuff. As a part of the agreement, Voyager and Palantir will explore the integration of Palantir's AI and ML and edge processing capabilities to support Star Lab station development, manufacturing, future operations. Sample use cases include space domain awareness, data fusion, and processing at the edge to enable autonomous decisions and to secure collaboration with allies. Uh, Sham Seker, CTO of Palantir, says the opportunity to partner with Voyager will set the stage for collaboration across the ecosystem of leading technology firms dedicated to this mission. Uh, this alliance represents a shared commitment to advancing the frontiers of global commerce, civil, and national security capabilities, reaffirming the critical role the industry has to bring to leading edge technology in the world of space. Okay, before we get even closer into it, why is this super important? Space is an industry that I don't know that much about. I'm learning more about it every other week. I'm interested in certain companies that are in that space. Um, obviously, we know that SpaceX is you know, one of the key leaders here, and SpaceX has plenty of governmental contracts in terms of what they're doing as well. Uh, but it is an untapped opportunity and a market for not only the commercial sector, but also for what the governments across the entire world are trying to do. We got some headlines over the past week that um, Russia is potentially thinking of like nuking satellites in space. Now, a lot of this stuff is speculative, but the idea is space is going to be one of the most geopolitically and commercially profitable industries over the next 20 years. And, and its space is untapped. Like we have, we have not really tapped into what is in there in outer space. I mean, yeah, we've sent satellites to the sky, but there is so much more to do. And that's obviously what SpaceX and Starlink and everybody is trying to kind of figure out because there's a massive market opportunity there. Palantir has a history in working in space. And we don't talk about it enough because obviously they don't have that many partnerships, but they do have some. And I want to talk about one of the previous partnerships they had in the past, but also I want to, before I get into that partnership, I want to talk about what is Edge AI. Edge AI is one of the core theses about their meta constellation product that you guys probably remember that uses geospatial intelligence to do real-time tracking. So I wrote here, Palantir's Edge AI technology connects software to sensors on satellites, enabling the immediate collection and analysis of data. This is particularly useful for applications such as autonomous vehicles and satellite missions where real-time data processing is critical. Palantir's entry into the space domain is not just about military applications. It also has implications for climate change monitoring, disaster management, supply chain optimization, etc. The ability to track natural disasters and make minute-by-minute -minute decisions can potentially save lives, resources, showcasing the versatility and potential of Palantir's technology in space. We've seen this before. There have been some videos in the past on Palantir's YouTube channel with uh, entities they have worked with when there were hurricanes coming up and Palantir was able to use their meta constellation geospatial intelligence product to be able to let people know or let the governments know that they were working with how to deal with certain crises from a natural disaster perspective. Obviously in Ukraine, meta constellation is being used in the context of, okay, you know, there is a tank from Russia. This is how you target it. And you need the real-time data at the edge, which means it's on the device itself. It doesn't have to go to a cloud to be able to compute and then come back. Just like autonomous vehicles, they don't have time when they need to make the left turn to go to the cloud so that it knows to make the left turn. It has to have edge AI, AI at the edge on the device to be able to make those autonomous decisions in real time. Same exact thing with what you're doing in space. And so there is a broad opportunity with what Palantir is trying to do here. Now, the partnership with the Voyager is an MOU or a Memoriam of Understanding. So it's not like an official signed partnership, but it's more so this idea that, hey, we're going to work together on this stuff and we'll eventually figure out the details and figure out what it's worth commercially, the money, all that stuff. But we want to work together in this specific domain. Now, they have a relationship with another company we talked about in early 2022. Uh, I doubt many people remember it, but let me know in the comments if you remember this at all. Satellogic. Satellogic, a company specializing in high-resolution satellite imagery, uh, the collaboration that they had was designed to harness the strengths of both companies to revolutionize the way satellite data is used for decision-making processes across various sectors. Satellogic's mission is to create a live catalog of Earth, providing daily updates through their satellite imagery, which can be used to address critical global challenges. Palantir, on the other hand, brings to table its advanced data analytics capability, including its Meta Constellation project and Edge AI technology. This partnership makes a lot of sense with Palantir software enhancing the processing and analysis of Satellogic's satellite images. It's expected to supercharge the capabilities for both companies, offering advanced geospatial products and tailored AI insights. Foundry basically acts as a centralized data analytics platform, integrating comprehensive data management and providing a holistic view of data analytics. So Palantir has already worked with companies in the past, Satellogic being one of them, in terms of, okay, you guys get the satellite images because your, your job is to sort of create this live catalog of Earth. We're going to give you the data analytical platform to be able to analyze all those images in real time using Edge AI. And that's where your symbiotic sort of combination and, and, and collaboration ultimately becomes between Palantir and some of these space companies. 
With Voyager, I have no idea what this partnership will ultimately turn into, but I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention because it's exciting. Space is pretty cool. You know, like space is, space is risky from an investment perspective. So there are some stocks out there that like if you bet on space, it might take them years and years and years to really make progress. And there's a lot of failure. But Poundtree at the end of the day is providing software. A lot of the satellites that are in the air need to be hooked up to some type of software to be able to make sense of all the data that they're processing. And you've got Poundtree that's doing it at the highest of levels on the battlefield. So to me, this is really cool. This is one of those partnerships that I think uh, is probably not going to get that much coverage, but it's an interesting partnership. And it just begs the question, I would love everyone to be able to comment what they think about this. Where do you think the commercial opportunities or the government contract opportunities exist in space for Palantir over the next decade? Because I would argue that there's going to be a lot of commercialization of space. A lot of companies are trying Amazon with Blue Origin and, and obviously uh, uh, SpaceX and Starlink. And then there's also obviously going to be companies or, or governmental contracts that want to send satellites into space or do certain things, obviously NASA with the contracts with SpaceX, and that's going to happen all around the world as space becomes a pseudo competitive advantage for a country to be able to have access to if they have their own proprietary technology inside of space. So uh, I think Palantir is going to play a critical role. Obviously, if anything you know happens with our adversaries, you want Palantir on the side of the United States working in space versus with Russia and China. And so I think that'll be interesting over the next decade. But yeah, let me know in the comments, what do you think Palantir's role could it be like in space? in the commercial sector, or through government contracts. Okay, last thing I want to talk about today. Uh, Mariana, our good friend, she asked a question at the Q4 earnings call, and uh, we didn't get a chance to react to it. So I want to play this question. Let's hear what management says. It's about government growth, and then we'll react to it on the back end. Here we go. Government on the second one today on financials. So the first one is this. You mentioned in your prepared remarks, reaccelerating U.S. government growth and opportunities across the board. But this is contrasting to what we have heard from the primes this quarter. They have agreed that more things are moving towards software, but they argue that the DOD has to figure out how to buy software, and they have to figure out how to sell software. From your point of view, how large is the change that is needed in this award approach but also, how large is the advantage that Palantir has in this environment where you have been selling software for a long time now? Yeah, look, I, I, we've been doing this for, for two decades, as you point out, and I think that gives us a perspective of what was it like two decades ago and what is it like now? And it's wildly different, and so much has changed. Now, I don't want to underestimate how much has to continue changing, and I think the department recognizes that and is, is working on that. But to not acknowledge the progress, I think, would, would be disingenuous here. Unlike the primes, who used to focus on hardware and now responding to software, we've always focused on software. One of the things about software is it evolves incredibly quickly. If you think about the software we were deploying uh, to do the Afghan non-combatant evacuation operations and how much that evolved moving into Ukraine, how much that evolved moving into the current crisis in CENTCOM, it is evolving faster than procurement can procure it. And I think one of the unique strengths that we have is that we're const we are investing and in mutating and managing the software independent of the actual procurement actions. And that means that we always have software that's so far in the future that it will meet the moment that the DOD actually has. It, as an addendum to that, um, the, the core thesis of, of, this, of Palantir was always the, the reality of a disjointed, violent world forces Pareto optimal conditions on institutions. So I believe that everyone knows we have the best software in the world. It may not matter in a non-dangerous environment, but it did matter in Ukraine and Israel, and who did they buy? It does matter. Our software is running in, with, I don't, I'll never know what I'm allowed to say, but in among the most critical places in the DOD. If, you fought, if we are forced to fight a three-pronged war, you cannot do that even from a perspective of keeping our munitions uh, ready without accurate software. So the, the more dangerous, the more real it gets, the more battle-tested and real your software has to be. I believe it's about to get very real. Why? Because our GDP growth is significantly better than China's. Now, I know the always wrong crowd says we then should get peace. But I'm telling you that the rational result of the rational uh, uh, consequences of that is our adversaries are like, America's going to be stronger tomorrow than today. It's like they don't have a GDP story because they cannot, they do not build these systems as well as we do. They do not have the tech community we do. And they do not have the U.S. market like we do. Re look at our results. And so... As this becomes more and more dangerous, the, 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 every company in the world 
whether they're small, big, whether they're startup, whether they're one of the largest primes, or whether us, is going to have to actually prove their software works on the battlefield. We love that. We want to prove, and we welcome and relish proving environments. If it was up to me, software would only be deployed at America and Western Allies if it was proven on the battlefield. Unfortunately for us, our adversaries are going to force that kind of adjudication. And how do we? And then, if you, and for those of you who can't evaluate that because you don't have access to our software in the battlefield, though you could read the news and see what Israel has done and what Ukraine has done. Basically, at that point, he's saying, if you can read the news, then you should know what's going on. And uh, if you know what's going on, you would know that Pound is a big deal. So two things there that, that Sham said and that Carp said that I thought were very important. Number one, Sham is saying in regards to how the government is procuring software, we are innovating faster than what they can buy. And this is incredibly interesting because his argument is when we deployed software in Afghanistan 10 years ago versus what we're doing in Ukraine and Israel, things have changed rapidly. And by the way, we were innovating on the change of that software to make it better, more exciting, more stronger, more efficient, more effective, etc. Before we got the deal, before we got the procurement, meaning we were dealing with the upfront costs, the talent costs, the labor costs, the compute costs to be able to make the software even better for the battlefield before we got any deals. So his argument there is that we are innovating faster than what the procurers can procure, meaning we are always going to be on the cutting edge. We are always going to be doing what we need to do. And eventually when the DOD steps up their spend, which Sean has been talking about a lot over the past couple of days, that spend should go to Palantir, which means it's Palantir is going to make a lot of money for the government. That That's what Sean's trying to say. Now, what Carp is saying is that all of these people that are questioning, you know, is Palantir's government business going to succeed or not succeed? Carp's argument is in a world that is disjointed, which we can see we are clearly in a world that is disjointed, that I don't think that's a debate. What matters is how effective your software is and why he, and then he says it mattered in Ukraine, it mattered in Israel, and who do they buy? They bought Palantir. And so, and that also kind of indicates that Ukraine did pay for Palantir software. Everyone's like, you know, did Ukraine actually pay? I know we gave it for free. I think Ukraine definitely did pay some amount of money for Palantir software. So from that perspective, Carp's argument is that from a, phil I mean, just from a broader philosophical argument that then goes down to the material nature of this point. Philosophically, when a world is disjointed, when you're in the worst crisis you can imagine, you need software that works. And in order to get software that works, I mean, you're going to have to go with the guys that work, which is going to be Palantir, because they're the ones that are the best software. And he says, I think the world knows that, but maybe the world is not in a position where they need a little bit of a nudge to finally understand why they know that. Ukraine needed that nudge. Israel needed that nudge. And then he says, we are being using some of the most critical parts of the DOD, basically establishing the argument that they know we are the best. Maybe they're not buying that much right now. We are innovating faster than what they can buy. So eventually when they do buy, they're going to buy us and the government business will cager internationally and domestically. So I think the broader point is that international government revenue and government revenue writ large for Palantir has not been good, has been growing, you know, single digits, low double digits. Eventually that will change, but we do have to give them time and we do have to let the market give it time. But that's why the U.S. business growing so fast will subsidize and offset the time that we need to be able to get the government business to grow. And I think if we just give them time, that time over the next year and a half, uh, we should see better growth in the government business. All right, that's it for me. Thank you, everybody, for joining Pound Weekly Weeklies tonight at 11 p.m. So make sure you check it out. If you're watching this after Friday, then you can go to the live on the YouTube channel and click on uh, Pound Weekly because that was that we're going to do that tonight. Uh, at 11 p.m. on Friday, so you can check it out. Uh, DailyPounder.substack.com. Please, please, please make sure to subscribe. We're five away from 3,000, so it would be awesome if you subscribe. It's free to subscribe. And that's pretty much it. Have a great weekend. We're staying in this 24 to 25 range. Let's see if we can keep it up. And I'll see you guys Monday on the next episode of Daily Pounder. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one.